Well, hi folks. Something a little different tonight. I thought I'd read to you the first novel in the Witcher series called The Last Wish by Andrzej Sapkowski. The Voice of Reason 1. She came to him towards morning. She entered very carefully, moving silently, floating through the chamber like a phantom. The only sound was that of her mantle brushing her naked skin. Yet this faint sound was enough to wake the witcher, or maybe it only tore him from the harsh slumber in which he rocked monotonously, as though travelling through fathomless depths, suspended between the seabed and its calm surface, amidst gently undulating strands of seaweed. He did not move, did not stir. The girl flitted closer, threw off her mantle, and slowly, hesitantly, rested her knee on the edge of the large bed. He observed her through lowered lashes, still not betraying his wakefulness. The girl carefully climbed onto the bedclothes and onto him. Wrapping her thighs around him, leaning forward on straining arms, she brushed his face with hair which smelt of chamomile. Determined, and as if impatient, she leant over and touched his eyelids, cheek, lips with the tips of her breasts. He smiled very slowly, delicately, grasping her by the shoulders, and she straightened, escaping his fingers. She was radiant, luminous, in the misty brilliance of dawn. He moved, but with pressure from both hands, she forbade him to change position, and, with a light but decisive movement of her hips, demanded a response. He responded. She no longer backed away from his hands. She threw her head back, shook her hair. Her skin was cool and surprisingly smooth. Her eyes glimpsed when her f face came close to his, were huge and dark as the eyes of a water nymph. Rocked, he sank into a sea of chamomile as it grew agitated and seethed. Chapter 1 Later, it was said, the man came from the north, from Roper's Gate. He came on foot, leading his laden horse by the bridle. It was late afternoon, and the ropers, saddlers, and tanners' stalls were already closed, the street empty. It was hot, but the man had a black coat thrown over his shoulders. He drew attention to himself. He stopped in front of the old Narracourt Inn, stood there for a moment, listened to the hubbub of voices. As usual at this hour, it was full of people. The stranger did not enter the old narrow court. He pulled his horse further down the street to another tavern, a smaller one called the Fox. Not enjoying the best reputations, it was almost empty. The innkeeper raised his head above a barrel of pickled cucumbers and measured the man with his gaze. The outsider, still in his coat, stood stiffly in front of the counter, motionless and silent. What will it be? Beer, said the stranger. His voice was unpleasant. The innkeeper wiped his hands on his canvas apron and filled a chipped earthenware tankard. The stranger was not old, but his hair was almost entirely white. Beneath his coat he wore a worn leather jerkin laced up at the neck and shoulders. As he took off his coat, those around him noticed that he carried a sword. Not something unusual in itself, nearly every man in Wisem carried a weapon, but no one carried a sword strapped to his back as if it were a bow or a quiver. The stranger did not sit at the table with the few other guests. He remained standing at the counter, piercing the innkeeper with his gaze. He drew from the tankard. I am looking for a room for the night. There's none, grunted the innkeeper, looking at the guest's boots, dusty and dirty. Ask at the old Narracourt. I would rather stay here. There is none, the innkeeper finally recognised the stranger's accent. He was Rivian. I'll pay, the outsider spoke quietly, as if unsure, and the whole nasty affair began. A pot-marked beanpole of a man who, from the moment the outsider had entered, had not taken his gloomy eyes from him, got up and approached the counter. Two of his companions rose behind him, no more than two paces away. There's no room to be had, 
you Rivian vagabond, rasped the pockmarked man, standing right next to the outsider. We don't need people like you in Wizen. This is a decent town. The outsider took his tankard and moved away. He glanced at the innkeeper, who avoided his eyes. It did not even occur to him to defend the Rivian. After all, who liked Rivians? All Rivians are thieves, the pockmarked man went on, his breath smelling of beer, garlic and anger. Do you hear me, you bastard? He can't hear you. His eyes are full of shite, and one of the men with him, and the second man crackled. Pay and leave, yelled the pocked man. Only now did the Rivian look at him. I'll finish my beer. We'll give you a hand, the pockmarked man hissed. He knocked the tank from the stranger's hand, and simultaneously grabbed him by the shoulder, dug his fingers into the leather strap which ran diagonally across the outsider's chest. One of the men behind him raised a fist to strike. The outsider curled up on the spot, throwing the pockmarked man off balance. The sword hissed in its sheath and glistened briefly in the dim night. The place seethed. There was a scream, and one of the few remaining customers tumbled towards the exit. A chair fell with a crash, and earthenware smacked hollowly against the floor. The innkeeper, his lips trembling, looked at the horribly slashed face of the pockmarked man, who, clinging with his fingers to the edge of the counter, was slowly sinking from sight. The other two were lying on the floor, one motionless, the other writhing and convulsing in a dark spreading puddle. A woman's hysterical scream vibrated in the air, piercing the ears as the innkeeper shuddered, caught his breath and vomited. The stranger retreated towards the wall, tense and alert. He held the sword in both hands, sweeping the blade through the air. No one moved. Terror, like cold mud, was clear on their faces, paralysing limbs and blocking throats. Three guards rushed into the tavern with thuds and clangs. They must have been close by. They had truncheons wound with leather straps at the ready, but at the sight of the corpses drew their swords. The Rivian pressed his back against the wall, and with his left hand pulled a dagger from his boot. Throw that down, one of the guards yelled with a trembling voice. Throw that down, you thug. You're coming with us. The second guard kicked aside the table between himself and the Rivian. Go get the men, Treska, he shouted to the third guard, who had stayed closer to the door. No need, said the stranger, lowering his sword. I'll come by myself. You'll go, you son of a bitch, on the end of a rope, yelled the trembling guard. Throw that sword down, or I'll smash your head in. The Rivian straightened. He quickly pinned his blade under his left arm, and with his right hand raised towards the guards, swiftly drew a complicated sign in the air. The clout nails which studied his tunic from his wrist to elbows flashed. The guards drew back, shielding their faces with their arms. One of the customers sprang up while another darted to the door. The woman screamed again, wild and ear-splitting. I'll come by myself, repeated the stranger in his resounding metallic voice, and the three of you will go in front of me. Take me to the castellan. I don't know the way. Yes, sir, mumbled the guard, dropping his head. He made towards the exit. Looking around tentatively, the other two guards followed him out backwards, hastily. The stranger followed in their tracks, seething, sheathing his sword and dagger. As they passed the tables, the remaining customers hid their faces from the dangerous stranger. Chapter 2 Valarad, Castellan of Wisem, scratched his chin. He was neither superstitious nor faint-hearted, but he did not relish the thought of being alone with the white-haired man. At last he made up his mind. Leave, he ordered the guards. And you, sit down. No, not there. Further away, if you please. The stranger sat down. He no longer carried his sword or black coat. I am Valorad, Castellan of Wisim, said Valorad, toying with a heavy mace lying on the table. And I am listening. What do you have to say to me, you brigand, before you are thrown into the dungeon? Three killed in an attempted spell-casting. Not bad, not bad at all. Men are impaled for such things in Wisem, but I am just a man, so I will listen to you before you are executed. Speak. The Rivian unbuttoned his jerkin and pulled out a wad of white goat leather. 
You nail this crossways and taverns, he said quietly. Is what's written here true? Ah, Valarad grunted, looking at the runes etched into the leather. So that's it, and I didn't guess at once. Yes, it's true. It's signed by Faltest, King of Temeria, Pontor and Mahakim, which makes it true. A proclamation is a proclamation, Watcher. But law is law, and I take care of law and order in Wisem. I will not allow people to be murdered. Do you understand? The Rivian nodded to show he understood. Valorad snorted with anger. You carry the witch's emblem. The stranger reached into his jerkin once more and pulled out a round medallion of a silver on a silver chain. It pictured the head of a wolf bearing its fangs. And do you have a name? Any name will do. It's simply to make a conversation easier. My name is Geralt. Geralt, then. Of Rivia. I gather from your accent. Of Rivia. Right. Do you know what, Geralt? This. Valorad slapped the proclamation. Let it go. It's a serious matter. Many have tried and failed already. This, my friend, is not the same as roughing up a couple of scoundrels. I know. This is my job, Valorad. And that proclamation offers a 3,000 Oren reward. 3,000? Valorad scowled. And the princess as a wife, or so the rumour says. Although gracious Foltest had not proclaimed that. I'm not interested in the princess, Geralt said calmly. He was sitting motionless, his hands on his knees, just in the three, th just in the three thousand. What times, sighed the Castellan, what foul times. Twenty years ago we would have thought, who would have thought, even in a drunken stupor, that such a profession as a witcher would exist. Itinerant killers of basilisks, travelling slayers of dragons and vodniks. Tell me, Geralt, are you allowed beer in your guild? Certainly. Valorad clapped his hands. Beer, he called. And sit closer, Geralt. What do I care? The beer, when it arrived, was cold and frothy. Foul times, Valorad muttered, drinking deep from his tankard. All sorts of filth has sprung up. Mahakam, in the mountains, is teeming with bogeymen. In the past it was just wolves howling in woods, but now it's cobalts and brigands when, wherever you spit. Werewolves or some other vermin, fairies and russelcas, snatch children from villages by the hundreds. We have diseases never heard of before. It makes my hair stand on end. And now to top it all this. He pushed the wad of leather back across the table. It's not surprising, Geralt. That you witches services are in demand. The king's proclamation, Castellan, Geralt raised his head. Do you know the details? Valorad leant back in his chair, locked his hands over his stomach. The details, yes, I know them. Not first hand, perhaps, but from a good source. That's what I want. If you insist, then listen. Valorad drank some beer and lowered his voice. During the reign of during the reign of Old Medal, his father, when our gracious king was still a prince, Foltes showed us what he was capable of, and he was capable of a great deal. We hoped he would grow out of it, but shortly after his coronation, Foltes surpassed himself. Jaw-droppingly, he got his own sister with child. Ada was younger, and they were always together, but nobody suspected anything except, perhaps, the queen. To get to the point, suddenly there is Ada with a huge belly and Foltest talking about getting wed to his sister. The situation was made even more tense because Vizimir of Nobigrad wanted his daughter, Dalka, to marry Foltest and had already sent out his envoys. We had to rest restrain Foltest from insulting them, and lucky we did, or Vizimir would have torn our insides out. Then, not without Ada's help, before she influenced her brother, we managed to dissuade the boy from a quick wedding. Well, then Ada gave birth. And now listen, because this is where it all starts. Only a few saw what she bore. But one midwife jumped from the tower window to her death, and the other lost her senses, and remains dazed to this day. So I gather that the royal bastard, a girl, was not comely, and she died immediately. 
No one was in a hurry to tie the umbilical cord, nor did Ada, to her good fortune, survive the birth. But then, Foltest stepped in again, wisdom dictated that the royal bastard should have been burned or buried in the wilderness. Instead, on the orders of our gracious king, she was laid to rest in a sarcophagus in the vaults beneath the palace. It's too late for your wisdom now, Geralt raised his head. One of the knowing ones should have been sent for. You mean those charlatans with stars on their hats? Of course. About ten of them came running later, when it became known what lay in the sarcophagus, and what scrambled out of it at night. Though it didn't start manifesting straight away, oh no, for seven years after the funeral there was peace. Then one night it was a full moon. There were screams in the palace, shouting and commotion. I don't have to tell you. This is your trade, and you've read the proclamation. The infant had grown in the coffin, and how? Grown to have incredible teeth, in a word. She became a striga. Pity you didn't see the corpses as I did. Had you, you'd have taken a great detour to avoid Wizen. Geralt was silent. Then, as I was saying, Valerad continued, Faltest summoned a whole crowd of sorcerers. They all jabbered at the same time, and almost came to blows with those staffs they carry, to beat off the dogs, no doubt, once they've been set loose on them. And I think they regularly are. I'm sorry, Geralt, if you have a different opinion of wizards. No doubt you do, in your profession, but to me they are swindlers and fools. You witches inspire greater confidence in men, at least you are more straightforward. Geralt smiled, but didn't comment. But to the point, the castellan peered into his tankard and poured more beer for himself and the Rivian. Some of, some of the sorcerer's advice didn't seem so stupid. One suggested burning the Striga together with the palace and the sarcophagus. Another advised chopping her head off. The rest were keen on driving aspen stakes into her body during the day, when the she-devil was asleep in her coffin worn out by a night's delights. Unfortunately, one, a jester, with a pointed hat and a bald pate, a hunchbacked hermit, argued it was magic, the spell could be undone, and the strigger would turn into Foltest's little daughter. As pretty as a picture. Someone simply had to stay in the crypt throughout the night, and that would be that. After which, can you imagine such a fool? He went to the palace for the night. Little of him was left in the morning, only, I believe, his hat and the stick. But Faltes clung to his idea like a burrow to a dog's tail. He forbade any attempt to kill the Strigger, and brought in charlatans from all corners of Wisem to reverse the spell and turn her into a princess. What colourful company! Twisted women, cripples, dirty and louse-ridden. It was pitiful. They went ahead and cast spells, mainly over a bowl and tankard. Of course some were quickly exposed as frauds by Faltest or the council. A few were even hung on their palisades, but not enough of them. I would have hung them all. I don't suppose I have to say that the Strigger, in the meantime, was getting her teeth into all sorts of people every now and again, and paying no attention to the fraudsters and their spells. Or that Faltest was no longer living in the palace. No one lived there any more. Valerad paused, drank some beer, and the Witcher waited in silence. And so it's been for seven years, Geralt, because she was born around fourteen years ago. We've had a few other worries, like war, with Vizimir of Nubigrad. Fought for real, understandable reasons, over the border posts. Not for some princess or marriage alli alliance, Faltes sporadically hints at marriage, and looks over portraits from neighbouring courts, which he then throws down the privy. And every now and then this mania seizes hold of him again, and he sends horsemen out to look for new sorcerers. His promised reward, the three thousand, has attracted any number of cranks, stray knights, even a shepherd known throughout the whole region as a, as a cretin. May he rest in peace, but the strigger is still doing well. Every now and again she gets her teeth into someone. You get used to it, and at least those heroes trying... To reverse the spell, have a use. The beast stuffs herself on the spot and doesn't roam beyond her palace. Poltest has a new palace, of course. Quite a fine one. In seven years, Geralt raised his head. In seven years, no one has settled the matter? Well, no. 
Balaran's gaze penetrated the Witcher, because the matter can't be settled. We have to come to terms with it, especially Foltest, our gracious and beloved ruler, who will keep nailing these proclamations up at crossroads, although there are, a f there are fewer volunteers now. There was one recently, but he insisted on the 3,000 in, in advance, so we put him in a sack and threw him in the lake. There is still no shortage of fraudsters, then. No, far from it, Castellan agreed without taking his eyes off the Witcher. That's why you mustn't demand gold in advance when you go to the palace, if you go. I'll go. It's up to you. But remember my advice. As we are talking of the reward, there has been word recently about the second part of it. I mentioned it to you, the princess for a wife. I don't know who made it up, but if the strigger looks the way they say, then it's an exceptionally grim joke. Nevertheless, there's been no lack of fools racing to the palace for the chance of joining the royal family. Two apprentice shoemakers, to be precise. Why are shoemakers so foolish, Geralt? I don't know. And witches, Castellan? Have they tried? There were a few, but when they heard the spell was to be lifted and the strigger wasn't to be killed, they mostly shrugged and left. That's one of the reasons why my esteem for witches has grown, Geralt. And one came along, younger than you, I forget his name, if he gave it at all. He tried, and... The fanged princess spread his entrails over a considerable distance. Geralt nodded. That was all of them? There was one other. Valorad maintains, remained silent for a while, and the witcher didn't urge him on. Yes, the castellan said finally. There was one more. At first, when Faltus threatened him with the noose if he killed or harmed the strigger, he laughed and started packing his belongings. But then, Valorad leaned across the table, lowered his voice to almost a whisper. Then he undertook the task. You see, Geralt, there are some wise men in Wisem, in high positions, who've had enough of this whole affair. Rumour has it these men persuaded the Witcher, in secret, not to fuss around with spells, but to batter the strigger to death and tell the king the spell had failed, that his dear daughter had been killed in self-defence. An accident at work. The king, of course, would be furious and refuse to pay an Oran in reward. But that would be the end to it. The witty witcher replied, We could have chased the striggers ourselves for nothing. Well, what could we do? We collected money, bargained, but nothing came of it. Geralt raised his eyebrows. Nothing, repeated Valorad. The witcher didn't want to try that, that first night. He trudged around, lay in wait, wandered about the neighbourhood. Finally, they say, he saw the strigger in action. As she does not clamber from her crypt just to stretch her legs. He saw her and scarpered that night, without a word. Geralt's expression changed a little, in what was probably supposed to be a smile. Those wise men, he said, they still have the money, no doubt. Witches don't take payment in advance. No doubt they still do, said Valorad. Does the rumour say how much they offer? Valorad bared his teeth in a smile. Some say eight hundred. Geralt shook his head. Others, murmured the Castellan, talked of a thousand. Not much when you bear in mind the rumour likes to exaggerate. And the king is offering three thousand. Don't forget about the betrothed, Valorad mocked. What are you talking about? It's obvious you won't get the three thousand. How's it obvious? Valorad thumped the table. Geralt, do not spoil my impression of witches. This has been going on for more than seven years. The Strigger is finishing off up to 50 people a year. Fewer now people are avoiding the place. Oh no, my friend, I believe in magic. I've seen a great deal, and I believe, to a certain extent, in the abilities of witches, wits, wizards and witches. But all this nonsense about lifting the spell was made up by a hunchbacked, snotty old man who'd lost his mind on the hermit's diet. It's nonsense, which no doubt no one but the Faltess believes. Ada gave birth to a strigger because she slept with her brother. That is the truth, and no spell will help. Now the strigger devours people, as striggers do. She has to be killed, and that is that. Listen, two years ago, 
peasants from some godforsaken hole near Mahakam were plagued by a dragon devouring their sheep. They set out together, battered the dragon to death with stanchions, and did not even think it worth boasting about. But we and Wisem are waiting for a miracle. Not a bad method, the witcher smiled. Are there fewer criminals? Not a bit of it. Which way to the palace, the new one? I will take you myself. And what about the wise men's suggestion? Castellan, said Geralt. Why act in haste? After all, I really could have an accident at work, irrespective of my intentions. Just in case, the wise men should be thinking about how to save me from the king's anger and get those fifteen hundred orans, of which rumour speaks, ready. It was to be a thousand. No, Lord Valorad, the witcher said categorically. The witcher, who was offered a thousand, ran at the mere sight of the strigger, without bargaining. So the risk is greater than a thousand. Whether it is greater than one and a half remains to be seen. Of course, I will say good-bye beforehand. Geralt, Valorad scratched his head. One thousand two hundred. No, this isn't an easy task. The king is offering three, and sometimes it is easier to lift a spell than to kill. But one of my predecessors would have done so, or killed the strigger, if this were simple. You think they let themselves be devoured out of fear of the king? Then, witcher, Valorad nodded wistfully, our agreement stands. But a word of advice, say nothing to the king about the danger of an accident at work. Chapter 3 Faltest was slim and had a pretty, too pretty face. He was under forty, the witcher thought. The king was sitting on a dwarf armchair, carved from black wood, his legs stretched out towards the hearth, where two dogs were warming themselves. Next to him on a chest sat an older, powerfully built man with a beard. Behind the king stood another man, richly dressed and with a proud look on his face. A magnate. A witcher from Rivia, said the king after the moment's silence, which fell after Valorad's introduction. Yes, your majesty. Geralt lowered his head. What made your hair so grey? Magic? I can see that you are not old. That was a joke. Say nothing. You've had a fair amount of experience, I dare presume. Yes, your majesty. I would love to hear about it. Geralt, I would even lower. Your majesty, you know our code of practice forbids us to speak of our work. A convenient code, witcher. Very convenient. But tell me, have you had anything to do with Sprigans? Yes. Vampires? There she is. Those two? Faltest hesitated. Strigas? Geralt raised his head, looking the king in the eyes. Yes. Faltest turns his eye away. Valorad? Yes, gracious majesty. Have you given him the details? Yes, ye greatest, gracious majesty. He says the spell cast on the princess can be reversed. I have known that for a long time. How, witcher? Oh, of course I forgot. Your code of practice. All right. I will make one small comment. Several witches have been here already. Valorad, you have told him. Good. So I know that your speciality is to kill rather than to reverse spells. This isn't an option. If one hair falls from my daughter's head, your head will be on the block. That is all. Ostrit, Lord... Segalan, stay and give him all the information he requires. Witches always ask a lot of questions. Feed him and let him stay in the palace. He is not to drift from the tavern from tavern to tavern. The king rose, whistled to his dogs and made his way to the door, scattering the straw covered covering the chamber floor. At the door he paused. If you succeed, Witcher, the reward is yours. Maybe I will add something if you do well. Of course, the nonsense spread by common folk about marrying the princess carries not a word of truth. I'm sure you don't believe I would give my daughter's hand to you, stranger. No, your majesty, I don't. Good, that shows you have some wisdom. Voltest left, closing the door behind him. Valorad and the magnet, who had been standing all the while, immediately sat at the table. 
the Castellan finished the king's half full cup, peered into the jug and cursed. Ostrid, who took Falter's chair, scowled at the witcher while he stroked the carved armrests. Segelin, the bearded man, nodded at Geralt. Do sit, witcher, do sit. Supper will be s will soon be served. What would you like to know? Castellan, Valorad, has probably already told you everything. I know him. He has sooner told you too much than too little. Only a few questions. Ask. The Castellan said that after the Strigger's appearance, the king called up many knowing ones. That's right. But don't say Strigger, say Princess. It makes it easier to avoid making a mistake in the king's presence, and any consequent unpleasantness. Was there anyone well known among the knowing ones? Anyone famous? There were such, then and later. I don't remember the names. Do you, Lord Ostrid? I don't recall, said the magnate, but I know some of them enjoyed fame and recognition. There was much talk of it. Were they in agreement that the spell can be lifted? They were far from any agreement, smiled Segelin, on any subject, but such an opinion was expressed. It was supposed to be simple, not even requiring magical abilities. As I understand it, it would suffice for someone to spend the night from sunset to the third crowing of the cock by the sarcophagus. Simple indeed, snorted Valorad. I would like to hear a description of the... The princess? Valorad leapt up from his chair. The princess looks like a strigger, he yelled. Like the most strigish strigger I have heard of. Her Royal Highness, the cursed royal bastard, is four cubits high, shaped like a bar barrel of beer, has a maw which stretches from ear to ear and is full of dagger-like teeth, has red eyes and a red mop of hair. Her paws, with claws like a wild cat's, hang down to the ground. I'm surprised we've yet to send her likeness to friendly courts. The princess, plague choker, is already fourteen. Time to think of giving her hand to her prince in marriage. Hold on, Ballarad, frowned Ostrid, glancing at the door. Segelin smiled faintly. The description, although vivid, is reasonably accurate. And that's what you wanted, isn't it, witcher? Ballarad didn't mention that the princess moves with incredible speed, and is far stronger for her height and build than one would expect, and she is fourteen years old, if that is of any importance. It is, said the witcher. Do the attacks on people only occur during the full moon? Yes, replied Saga Se Segelin. If she attacks beyond the old palace, within the palace walls, people always die, irrespective of the moon's space, but she only ventures out during the full moon, and not always then. Has there been even one attack during the day? No. Does she always devour her victims? Ballarad spat vehemently on the straw. Come on, Geralt. It'll be supper soon. Pish. Devours, take a bite, takes a bite and leave, leaves aside. It varies according to her mood, no doubt. She only bit his head from one gutted a couple, and a few more she picked clean to the bone, sucked them dry, you could say. Damn mothers. Careful, Valorad, snarled Ostrid. Say what you want about the strigger, but do not insult Adder in front of me, as you would not dare in the king's presence. Has anyone she's attacked survived? the witcher asked, apparently paying no special attention to the magnate's outburst. Segelin and Ostrid looked at each other. Yes, said the bearded man. At the very beginning, seven years ago, she threw herself at two soldiers standing guard over the crypt. One escaped. And then, interrupted Valorad, there was another, the miller she attacked near the town. You remember? Chapter 4 The following day, late in the evening, the miller was brought to the small chamber above the guardhouse allocated to the witcher. He was led in by a soldier in a hooded coat. The conversation did not yield any significant results. The miller was terrified. He mumbled and stammered, and his scars told the witcher more than he did. The strigger could open her jaws impressively wide and had extremely sharp teeth, including very long upper fangs, four of them, two on each side. Her claws were sharper than a wildcat's, but less curved, and it was only because of that the miller had managed to tear himself away. 
Having finished his examination, Geralt nodded to the miller and soldier, dismissing them. The soldier pushed the peasant through the door and lowered his hood. It was Foltest himself. "'Sit. Do not get up,' said the king. "'This visit is unofficial. Are you happy with the interview? I heard you were at the palace this morning. Yes, your majesty. When will you set about your task? It is four days until the full moon. After that. You prefer to have a look at her yourself beforehand? There is no need, but having had her fill, the the princess will be less active. Strigger, Master Witcher, Strigger, let us not play at diplomacy. She will be a princess afterwards, and that is what I have come to talk about. Answer me unofficially, briefly and clearly. Will it work or not? Don't hide behind your code. Geralt rubbed his brow. I confirm, Your Majesty, that the spell might be reversed, and unless I am mistaken, it can be done by spending the night at the palace. The third crowing of the cock, as long as it catches the strigger outside her sarcophagus, will end the spell. That is what is usually done with striggers. So simple? It is not simple. First you have to survive the night. Then there are exceptions to the rule. For example, not one night, but three. Consecutively, there are also cases which are, well, hopeless. Yes, Foltest bristled. I keep hearing that from some people. Kill the monster because it's an incurable case, Master Witcher. I, uh, I'm sure they have already spoken to you. Am I right? Hack the man to death without any more fuss at the beginning and tell the king nothing else could be done. I won't pay, but they will. Very convenient and cheap, because the king will order the witcher beheaded or hanged and the gold will remain in their pockets. The king unconditionally orders the witcher to be beheaded. Geralt grimaced. Foltest looked at the Rivian in the eyes for a long while. The king does not know, he finally said, but the witcher should bear such an inevitability in mind. Geralt was silent for a moment. I intend to do what is in my power, he said, but if it goes badly, I will defend my life, your majesty. You must also be prepared for such an eventuality. Foltest got up. You do not understand me. It's obvious you will kill her if it becomes necessary, whether I like it or not, because otherwise she'll kill you. Surely and inevitably. It won't punish anyone who kills her in self-defence. But I will not allow her to be killed without trying to save her. There have already been attempts to set fire to the old palace. They shot at her with arrows, dug pits and set traps and snares until I hung a few of her attackers. But that is not the point. Witcher, listen. I'm listening. After the third crowing of the cock, there will be no strigger if I understand correctly. What will there be? If all goes well, a fourteen-year-old girl, with red eyes, crocodile teeth, a normal fourteen-year-old girl, except that, well, physically, I see, and mentally, every day, a bucket of blood for breakfast, a little girl's thigh. No, mentally, there is no telling, on the level, I think, of a three- or four-year-old child. She'll require loving care for a long while. That's obvious, Witcher. I'm listening. Can it happen to her again, later on? Geralt was silent. Ah, said the king. I can. And what then? Should she die after a long swoon lasting several days, her body will have to be burned, quickly. Foltest grew gloomy. I do not think it will come to that, added Geralt. Just to be sure, I will give you some instructions, Your Majesty, to lessen the danger. Right now, it is not too soon, Master Witcher, and if... Right now, interrupted the Rivian, many things may happen, Your Majesty. It could be that you'll find a princess in the morning, the spell already broken, and my corpse. Even so, despite my permission to defend yourself, which, it seems, wasn't that important to you, this is a serious matter, Your Majesty. The risk is great. That is why you must listen. The princess should always wear a sapphire around her neck, or better, an inclusion on a silver chain, day and night. What is an inclusion? A sapphire with a pocket of air trapped within the stone. Aside from that, every now and then you should, you should burn juniper, broom and aspen in the fireplace of her chamber. Foltest grew pensive. 
and thank you for your advice, Witcher. I will pay heed if... And now listen to me carefully. If you find the case is hopeless, kill her. If you undo the spell, but the girl is not... Normal. If you have a shadow of doubt as to whether you have been entirely successful, kill her. Do not worry, you have nothing to fear from me. I'll shout at you in front of the others, banish you from the palace and the town, nothing more. Of course I won't give you the reward, but maybe you'll manage to negotiate something from you-know-who. They were both quiet for a while. Geralt, for the first time, Voltes called the Witcher by his name. Yes... How much truth is there in the rumour that the child is as she is because Ada was my sister? Not much. A spell has to be cast. They don't cast themselves. But I think your congress with your sister was the reason the spell was cast, and this is the result. As I thought. That is what some of the knowing ones said, although not all of them, Geralt. Where do such things come from? Spells? Magic? I don't know, your majesty. Knowing one study the causes of such phenomena, for us witches, the knowledge that, con that concentrated will can cause such phenomena is enough. That and the knowledge to fight them and kill them. Usually, besides, that is what we're usually paid for. Only a few demand the reversal of spells, Your Majesty. As a rule, people simply want to defend themselves from danger. If the monster has men on its conscience, then revenge can also come into play. The king got up, took a few paces across the chamber, and stopped in front of the witch's sword hanging on the wall. Would this, he asked, not looking at Geralt? No, that is for men. So I heard. Do you know what, Geralt? I'm going to the crypt with you. Out of the question. Faltas turned, his eyes glinted. Do you know, sorcerer, that I have not seen her? Neither after she was born, nor later. I was afraid. I may, I may never see her. Am I not right? At least I have the right to see my daughter while you are murdering her. I repeat, it's out of the question. It is certain death, for me as well as you. If my attention, my will falters. No, your majesty, Faltas turns away. Started towards the door. For a moment, Geralt thought he would leave without a word, without a parting gesture, but the king stopped and looked at him. You inspire trust, he said, although I know what a rogue you are. I was told what happened at the tavern. I'm sure you killed those thugs solely for word to spread, to shock people, to shock me. It's obvious that you could have dealt with them without killing. I'm afraid I'll never know whether you are going there to save my daughter or to kill her, but I agree to it. I have to agree. Do you know why? Geralt did not reply. Because, I think, said the king, I think she is suffering. Am I not right? The witcher fixed his penetrating eyes on the king. He didn't confirm it, didn't nod, didn't make the slightest gesture, but Faltest knew. He knew the answer. Chapter 5 Geralt looked out of the palace window for the last time. Dusk was falling rapidly. Beyond the lake, the distant lights of Wysim twinkled. There was a wilderness around the old palace, a strip of no man's land with which, over seven years, the town had cut itself off from this dangerous place, leaving nothing but a few ruins, rotten beams, and the remains of a gap-toothed palisade, which had obviously not been worth dismantling and moving. As far away as possible, at the opposite end of the settlement, the king had built his new residence. The stout tower of his new palace loomed black in the distance against the darkening blue of the sky. In one of the empty, plundered chambers, the witcher returned to the dusty table at which he was preparing, calmly and meticulously. He knew he had plenty of time. The strigger would not leave her crypt before midnight. On the table in front of him, he had a small chest with metal fittings. He opened it. Inside, packed tightly in compartments lined with dried grass, stood small vials of dark glass. The witcher removed three. From the floor, he picked up an oblong packet, thickly wrapped in sheep's skins and fastened with a leather strap. He unwrapped it and pulled out a sword with an elaborate hilt. In the black, shiny scabbard covered with rows of runic signs and symbols, he drew the blade, which lit up with a purple shine of mirror-like brightness. It was pure silver. 
Geralt whispered an inc incantation and drank, one after the other, the contents of two vials, placing his left hand on the blade of the sword after each sip. Then, wrapping himself tightly in his black coat, he sat down on the floor. There were no chairs in the chamber or in the rest of the palace. He sat motionless, his eyes closed. His breathing, at first even, suddenly quickened, became rasping and tense, and then stopped completely. The mixture which helped the witcher gain full control of his body was chiefly made up of verati veratrum, stramonium, hawthorn and spurge. The other ingredients had no name in any human language. For anyone who was not like Geralt, inured to it from childhood, it would have been lethal poison. The witcher turned his head abruptly. In the silence his hearing sharpened beyond measure. Easily picked out a rustle of footsteps through the courtyard, overgrown with stinging nettles. It could not be the strigger. The steps were too light. Geralt threw his sword across his back, hid his bundle in the hearth of the ruined chimney place, and, silent as a bat, ran downstairs. It was still light enough in the courtyard for the approaching man to see the witcher's face. The man, Ostrid, backed away abruptly. An involuntary grimace of terror and repulsion contorted his lips. The witcher smiled wryly. He knew what he looked like. After drinking a mixture of banewood, monk's hood and eyebright, the face takes on the colour of chalk, and the pupils fill the entire iris. But the mixture enables one to see in the deepest darkness, and this is what Geralt wanted. Ostrid quickly regained control. You look as if you were already a corpse, Witcher, he said. From fear, no doubt. Don't be afraid. I bring you reprieve. The Witcher did not reply. Don't you hear what I say, you Rivian charlatan? You're saved and rich. Ostrid hefted a sizable purse in his hand and threw it at Geralt's feet. A thousand orans. Take it, get on your horse and get out of here. The Rivian still said nothing. Don't gawp at me, Ostrid raised his voice, and don't waste my time. I have no intention of standing here until midnight. Don't you understand? I do not wish you to undo the spell. No, you haven't guessed. I am not in league with Valorad and Segalin. I don't want you to kill her. You are simply to leave. Everything is to sit. stay as it is. The Witcher did not move. He did not want the Magnate to realise how fast his movements and reactions now were. It was quickly growing dark. A relief, as even the semi-darkness darkness of dusk was too bright for his dilated pupils. And why, sir, is everything to remain as it is? he asked, trying to enunciate after each word, slowly. Now that um, Ostrid raised his head proudly, should really be of li li should really be of damn little concern to you. And what if I already know? Go on. It will be easier to remove Foltest from the throne if the Strigger frightens the people even more. If the royal madness completely disgusts both magnates and common folk, am I right? I came here by way of Redania and Novigrad. There is much talk there that there are those in Wisem who look to King Viz Vizimir as their saviour and true monarch. But I, Lord Ostrich, do not care about politics, or the successions to thrones, or revolutions in palaces. I am here to accomplish my task. Have you never heard of a sense of responsibility and plain honesty? About professional ethics? Careful to whom you speak, you vagabond, Ostrid yelled furiously, placing his hand on the hilt of his sword. I have had enough of this. I am not accustomed to hold such discussions. Look at you. Ethics, codes of practice, morality... Who are you to talk? A brigand who's barely arrived before he starts murdering men, who bends double to Foltest and behind his back bargains with Valorad like a hired thug, and you dare to turn your nose up at me, you serf, play at being a knowing one, a magician, you scheming witcher. Be gone before I run my flat of my sword across your gob. The witcher did not stir. He stood calmly. You'd better leave, Lord Ostrid, he said. It's growing dark. Ostrid took a step back, drew his sword in a flash. You asked for this, you sorcerer. I'll kill you. Your tricks won't help you. I carry a turtle stone. Geralt smiled. 
The reputation of Turtle Stone was mis as mistaken as it was popular, but the witch was not going to lose his strength on spells, much less expose his silver sword's contact with Ostrich's blade. He dived under the whirling blade, on the heel of his hand, and his silver-studded cuff hit him in the temple.